in the band. So tonight we are um, we are working through the book of Ephesians and John. Uh, our John Boglin runs all things tech for us, so that's why we don't have lyrics on the screen. And if you're watching online, that's why it doesn't look as good. It doesn't sound as good because. I wanted to say I'm going old school live streaming. Can you say that? Live streaming's only been around for a few years. But I'm going old school live streaming tonight by just using my phone turned sideways on a tripod. It's a light ring behind it, but the lights aren't turned on. I just had to get it up high enough. Um, so that's why if you're watching online, I know we have some people watching and perhaps listening online at some point today, tomorrow, the next day. That's why the quality won't be normally what we have. Um, so when you see John, if you're watching online, when you see John next, just thank him for all that he does to make this look and sound good every week, because it, I'm sure it's not anywhere close. So tonight we're continuing Ephesians. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 6. And what we're going to see over the next few weeks, starting tonight and continuing really through the end of the year, um, if, if you studied Paul's letters... His pattern is that he spends the first half, generally, or so, um, kind of un unpacking his theology, just laying out what his theology is, what the gospel is, who Jesus is, who we are. And then he always turns a corner in the book. Maybe it's in chapter 4, maybe it's in chapter 12 in the book of Romans. It's, it's around chapter 12 where he turns the corner. But he always turns a corner in the book because, hear me, like, theology doesn't exist in a vacuum. All of the theology that the Apostle Paul gives us is supposed to make a claim on our life, like on Tuesday in Bradenton or Sarasota in 2023. See, for, for us to try to separate theology from like lifestyle is a dangerous kind of thing because Paul's saying like he's giving he's giving the church and he's giving us all of these rich and deep truths and he's saying now here's what you're supposed to do with everything I've just told you. Like I've laid out this, the beauty of the gospel. I've laid out the greatness of Jesus. I've great, laid out all of this stuff for you. And now here's the so what part. That's the pivot we're going to start tonight. It's this shift from belief to lifestyle, or from right theology to right action, from doctrine to devotion, whatever you want to call it. Because for Paul, hear me, and if you write anything down, maybe you write this down. Paul had no category for belief that didn't affect lifestyle. In the Apostle Paul's mind, there was no category for a belief that didn't affect how we live. And what I would say, to set, to, to set the stage for tonight, what I have seen and what I continue to see is that there are these two massive errors when we talk about belief and lifestyle. These two massive errors, and they're equally damning, in my opinion. On the one hand, you get this legalistic mindset that suggests we're trying to earn things from God. We're, we're on the, the scales, and we just need to tip the scales the right way. We need to tell the truth most of the time. We need to not cheat on our spouse or our taxes. We need to like not litter too much. We need to do all of these things, go to church a couple of times a month if it's convenient. We try to do all of these things, try not to say bad words, don't cuss or whatever, and we're good with God. We go to church, we don't cuss, we don't cheat on our taxes or our spouse, and we're good. That's legalism, where we try to earn something. Anytime we talk about belief and lifestyle, there's this massive error where people think they have to earn something. Becky and I were talking before service started that Jesus paid it all. Like, all of it. Every last penny. Every bit of it. So one of the errors is this error of legalism. The other one, which I think it's more evident in churches today, at least in America. It's not evident in third world churches, but it's definitely evident in America is we try to disconnect belief from lifestyle. We say one thing for an hour on Saturday night or Sunday morning, maybe even in our small group, but we live a completely inconsistent life the other 166 hours. It's 
equally mass an equally massive error, and it's nonsensical. It's been floating around American church culture for decades that we can separate belief from lifestyle, and it's just not true. It's not. Like the Bible has no category for a belief that doesn't impact living. Like in the first century, the word belief, like we always act upon beliefs. Like we, we act on it. And there's this massive error that's just as nonsensical as legalism is that we can separate it. That, you know what, we just go to church, check the box, and it doesn't really impact anything in our lives the rest of the week. It's just not true. So if you're not already there, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is kind of the pivot point where Paul starts to give us the so what for three chapters. And we've been studying it for several weeks now. For three chapters, Paul's given us this incredibly beautiful theology, and now he's pivoting to the so what. Because of everything I've told you, this is what we got to do. This is what it commands us to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you've received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Let me pray for us. God, as we open your word, I pray that you would use it. That your spirit and your word would work together in our hearts tonight and our minds tonight to draw us closer to Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. So Paul gives us this, this word, therefore. I'll never forget. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but I'll never forget. My best friend in middle school, his name was Brad Hunter. We were in the eighth grade together, and we competed in the, the spelling bee. And it's the one where, like, if you win the county, you can go to the state. If you win the state, you can go to, like, the scripts. And now it's sponsored. But back then, this is, like, 35 years ago. It wasn't sponsored. But my friend, Brad Hunter, got the word, therefore, and he forgot the E. And for the next 30-plus years, I've never forgotten that. That my best friend from, from middle school, Brad Hunter, forgot the E on therefore. This has nothing to do with sermon. But it's just, like, I've never misspelled therefore after he got... Out of, he got, got kicked out of the spelling bee for dropping the E off there for. But it's, it's, that's just a funny story. But Paul, is that's how we know that he's pivoting. He uses the word therefore. And he introduces himself. He reminds them that he's a prisoner of the Lord. Yes, Caesar had him locked up, but he was not Caesar's prisoner, if that makes sense. He was Jesus' prisoner. That was, the only, that was the only master he would ever recognize. He was Jesus' prisoner prisoner. And he says to them, he says, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. He's saying, if you believe what I've written, if the gospel has changed your life, you need to get your shoes on because we've got to walk. So that's the first point tonight. Get your shoes on, John. <laughs> I'm just sorry, I've been messing with you, man. I, I couldn't resist. We got a small group tonight, so I couldn't resist, man. I couldn't resist. But he's saying, go get your shoes on because we gotta walk. And it's not the only place where Paul tells a church or a group of churches to walk or to live worthy of the gospel or worthy of the calling. We would see this in Philippians chapter one, where Paul tells the church in Philippi, he says, live your life worthy of the gospel. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says he prayed that this church would be filled with the power of the Spirit so they would walk worthy of the Lord. You know, like that's the theme, this, this idea of Jesus has saved us. Now let's match, match our life to our belief. That's what he's saying. He's like, match your life to your belief. First Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says that he implored them, like he's begging them, to commanding them to walk worthy worthy of the Lord. In my English translation, it says urge. It says, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling. 
you urge. It's not like a suggestion, right? But I suggested to one of my sons that he do something by a certain time. But then I made sure that he did it. I pushed him forward. I tried to be nice. But this one of my sons needed something a little stronger than, oh, well, dad thought it might be a good idea to maybe think about doing this now. So nobody, you're doing it now. Let's go. Like the, the idea where Paul says, I urge you, he's not saying like if you feel like it and you slept well last night, he's pushing them forward with force. It's this idea of a forceful command where he says, walk worthy of the Lord, regardless of how we're feeling today. He's saying, live your life in a way that brings glory and honor to God. And what I suggest to you is that this is a pastoral call. And as a pastor, like, if I know you're failing in an area, I'm going to pastorally love you enough to tell you that. I've had some of those conversations. And, and we've actually lost people from our church. We've lost people from the old church. We've lost people from this church that didn't want to hear it. But I'm not going to change what the book says. I'm going to call us all, myself first and foremost, to live lives worthy, to walk worthy of our calling. I'm going to push us all toward godliness. That's one of the reasons why we go through books of the Bible, because this isn't about entertainment. Like our, our music team is great. Even without a drummer tonight, they sound great. They sound great every week. We have great music. But it's not about entertainment. It's about Focusing our minds and our hearts on Jesus. That's why we go through books of the Bible, because I, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to urge you to walk worthy of the Lord. And the only way I know to do that is to point you to the Lord. One of the things I've been convicted on, especially lately, as we've looked through the, the book of Ephesians, is the corporate nature and when I say corporate, like we call our prayer time corporate because we're praying collectively as a church. And when I say corporate, I just mean group. I don't mean like incorporated or company. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I've become increasingly convicted of is the corporate nature of our walk, the corporate nature of our witness, the corporate element of the church. Because we live in such an individualized society where we could just be like, oh, me and Jesus, I'll watch it on Facebook and you know, that's good. I've heard the band, and I've heard what Paul, what funny story Paul told about his childhood tonight. Um, but we have to be together. And so it's not just Paul walk worthy of the Lord, and Becky walk worthy of the Lord, and Tim walk worthy of the Lord. But it's also like our marriages, and then our families, and then our church. I urge you as a group of people together, there has to be a corporate element of it. That we would together be walking worthy of the Lord. And that, that word worthy, like any dad of a daughter knows, like there ain't nobody that's going to match up to my little girl. Isn't that right, John? Isn't that right, Tim? That's right. Like, I, it, it, there is no pimple face, face punk at Brady River High School that is worthy of grace or luck to help him. I'm just going to be honest. Because... The idea of worthy is being matched, right? And so what, what Paul says when he says, walk worthy of the Lord, it's funny to talk about, like, uh, guys trying to date my daughters. But really, it's the idea of being matched. And what Paul says is, is let your walk, your life, your actions match the beauty of the gospel that you cling to. There should be some consistency there. Not perfection, but consistency. Walk worthy of the calling that you have received, that you've been blessed, called, predestined, redeemed, adopted, and saved in Christ. You have a new identity and a new purpose. And walk, live your life in a way consistent with that. The idea of worthiness is consistency, not perfection. None of us will reach perfection. But overarching consistency. I think I've told this story before, so maybe it'll make you laugh again. But when Dylan was in daycare, he heard some very creative language. He had no idea what he was saying. He said words that would make the sailor blush because there was one little boy in the class that had a challenging home life, and it was hearing some language. I mean, really, it's, it's just sad that my four-year-old son picked this up from another four-year-old. 
because no four-year-old should have to hear those words at home. But that's where he picked it up. He picked it up from one of his kids at home. And I told the, the little teacher, I call it teacher, it's just daycare, but whatever. They call, I told the teacher, we don't speak that way in our home. And what Dylan's learned is that it helps him then speak differently. And they turned it into this little clappy, clappy game where they would sit in the circle. And if one of the little kids who has a challenging home life said a word, they would turn into the little, little clappy, clappy game. And they would do one of these, right? And they would say, Helton, boys speak differently. And they would go around <laughs> like, and it would be, Johnson, girls speak different. Like, we don't speak that way. A little clappy, clappy game. Because Dylan has my name. And the Helton men don't speak that way. And his language needs to match his identity. It's a, it's a funny little story, but I think it's powerful because he knows he's carrying the Helton name. And he doesn't speak the way that others may speak. We're carrying the name of Christ. And our entire lives are called to align with the name that we're carrying. To walk worthy of the calling you have received. Some of us may need sandals, slip-ons, and maybe even Velcro, but all of us need to get some shoes on. If you need help tying your shoes, let me know. I hate feet, they're gross. I really do. I hate feet, can't stand feet. But uh, all of us need to put our shoes on. We need to get our shoes on so we can get to work. We need to get our shoes on so we can get walking. Now, remember though, those two errors that I talked about at the very front end, the, the legalism error where it's all about what we do, 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 disconnect, and, and the disconnected lifestyle error, error. So we have these two errors. We need to understand the call to living in a certain way, living as a citizen of heaven, living as a son of God. We need to understand that through the lens of these two massive errors that churches make where it's all about your actions or all about your belief with no claim on your actions. See, we need to understand that our actions are rooted in our beliefs, that we love Jesus and we want to serve and honor Jesus. And because the love that he has shown us when we were completely unlovable, completely unworthy, the fact that he saved us when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, that he called us from the grave, that propels us. His love for us changes everything in how we live. So we need to understand it properly because we cannot, it's too much at stake to make one of these two massive errors where it says, it's all about act, and act, 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 act. Versus just believe, don't worry about what you do. The other hundred, like those two errors are equally massive. See, our actions have to be rooted from the overflow of our relationship with Christ. If you look in the Gospels, Jesus spent so much time talking to the Father. He would retreat to Christ. He would retreat, pull back from doing things to make sure the relationship with the Father was right. And I think that's our model. Like We need to, to act out of the overflow of our heart that's fully submitted to God, as a prisoner to God. And that's how we're going to avoid one of these massive two errors. That it's, it's just about how we talk and how we spend our money and how we eat and make sure we go to church three or four times a month versus it's in, your actions don't really matter. Because James would say faith without works is dead. Paul had already even told us, he said, you've been saved by grace, not of works. Saved by grace through faith, not of works. Lest anyone should boast. But the very next verse, it says, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So we, we walk in the works that he's called us to out of a heart that is fully surrendered and fully submitted to him. So go get your shoes on. It's only possible by the power of the Spirit. It's point number two. We walk worthy of our calling only by the power of the Spirit. Verse two and three says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Like, there's lots of descriptors for there. In, in those two verses. There's lots of descriptors in those two verses. And the first thing he says 
is humility. With all humility. Like this deep-rooted understanding of God's greatness and our sinfulness. That leads to a deep-rooted concern for others. Not necessarily, like I've heard it, heard it described that humility isn't necessarily thinking, thinking of yourself, thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Like we're not concerned with our own self, we're concerned with the glory of God and the service of others. Humility, with all humility. I heard this week, I was at a conference with Victoria for a few days, and one of the things I wrote down from this meeting, it says that we can choose to humble ourselves, or God will humble us. Either way, if you're a Christian, you will be humbled. We can choose to walk in humility, or God will humble us. Next, he says, in gentleness, with all humility and Gentleness. Can I tell you, this is something I struggle with. I want to swing a sledgehammer most of the time. Metaphorically speaking. But did you know there's all kinds of different types of hammers for what you're wanting to do? There's a thing called a finish hammer. It has a perfectly flat head so that it doesn't leave marks if you're driving a nail into floor molding, shoe molding, or crown molding. This thing called a finish hammer where you just tack in a really small Nails, and it has a perfectly flat head, so it doesn't leave a mark. But then there's a sledgehammer where if you need to knock down cement bricks or just have some fun with some TVs that are old and worthless. I let my boys do that. But you get my point. Like I, I struggle with gentleness because my first reaction is to grab, grab the sledgehammer, but the gentle person knows when to use which hammer. That makes sense? It's interesting to me, too. Like I've... I, like early on, I can remember being being interviewed as part of my ordination council before I was ordained as a pastor. I'm participating in another gentleman's ordination council in a, in a week or two, um, and I was thinking about this as I was writing this sermon that I'm going to have to. Talk, I, I'm going to bring this up. Think about ordination council interviews at First Baptist, interviews at other churches before we decided to plant this church, interviews with the North American Mission Board before uh, they gave us the seal of approval as a church planting couple, all of this stuff. Can I tell you, not a single time was I asked about the spiritual discipline of gentleness. You know, it's a requirement of a pastor. Gentleness. They checked out how, how what my stage presence was. They checked out my ability to cast a vision. They checked out the strength of my marriage, the health of our children, the emotional health of our children. They even asked some financial questions. Never once did they say, how do you practice the spiritual discipline of gentleness? It's a requirement. It's in the book. It's a requirement of an elder of the church. Gentleness. And I would suggest to you that the requirement as a pastor to be gentle isn't um, a requirement to be melba toast. It's just a requirement to know what hammer to use and when. Because there are instances where you've got to grab that sledgehammer. There's lots of instances where you need that finish hammer instead. And Paul's calling all of the church at Ephesus, not just the pastors. He's calling all of the church there to practice gentleness. He says, with all humility and gentleness. Like, we should be known as being gentle people, not weak or timid, but self-controlled. In the best way I can describe it, knowing which hammer to use. Knowing which hammer to use. This is with patience. Patience with one another and with ourselves. Patience. Bearing with one another in love. This selfless love for others that is rooted in the great love that God has shown us. Not just some emotional feeling that you get with your spouse or your children or your family. But this selfless, purposeful love that we choose that is rooted in the great love God has shown us. And he says, working to maintain. He says, make every effort. The idea of working, this is a strenuous thing, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Something that is a gift of the Spirit, but we work to maintain it. The unity that the Holy Spirit gives the church, the unity of Christ. And now remember, this was not a, 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 uh, a church of all people that were the same. I mean, you had Gentiles and you had Jews, and they were told from the moment they were born that they should hate each other. Like, 
hate each other. The Jews were told the Gentiles were all dirty and unclean. And the Gentiles were, were told, ah, you don't want to be yeah, having anything to do with those guys. Those guys hate you. We hate them back. But the unity that we have in Christ is a gift of the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only way to explain it. And he's saying, work to maintain it. Yes, it's a gift, but work to maintain it. You want to know how? Humility. Patience. Kindness toward one another. Bearing with one another in love. Work to maintain the unity. And this list is so similar to the fruit of the Spirit that Paul lays out in Galatians chapter 5. You know that you know it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So similar. And they just don't happen by accident. These, the fruit of the Spirit does not grow in us personally, does not grow in our marriages, does not grow in our homes, and does not grow in our church on accident. Like you're not just going to accidentally wake up and have mangoes on your left shoulder. Like it doesn't grow by accident. They can only grow in us as we walk by faith, that we trust the Spirit of God in us, not just as individuals, but as a church, because we're part of one family. That's the next point. One family, as a part of one family. Next few verses, these are not just taglines for Paul, where he says there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. These are not just taglines, but these are at the heart of the entire book of Ephesians, the unity of the church. Paul so desperately wants this church to be united in the gospel. To not choose other things that can divide us, but to unite in the gospel. He's pointing to the unity that they have in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. This is a Trinitarian three verses. So there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that you're calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father. You hear the Trinity there, Spirit, Son, Father. This is a Trinitarian call to unity. We reflect the unity that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have. We're called to be united together. The unity we have in God, the unity we have in the church as one family. As a part of one family. So I just want to end with just a couple of things to consider. How do we do this? How do we walk Worthy of our calling that we have received. All of this beautiful, rich theology. How do we live our lives in a way that's consistent, that matches, that's worthy? And what I would say is the only way is by faith. By faith. The first way is by faith. When I and when I say faith, I don't mean faith in faith. Some people that I know that aren't Christians that have no religious interest at all, certainly no devotion to Jesus, will say, oh, well, you just have to have faith. That just is like a baptized way of saying, we just wishful thinking. We don't have faith in faith, but we have faith in a person who is real, who is powerful, and who is in control of everything. We are not hoping for the best. We have a positive certainty expressed in action. That's the best definition that I've ever heard of faith, other than the, how it's defined in Scripture, Another pastor out west, he says, positive certainty expressed in action. The author of Hebrews says that without faith it is impossible to please God, for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Positive certainty expressed in action. We live by faith. And as we act on the belief that we have, as we act on the belief that we have, we will see our faith continue to grow. Or better yet, our faith isn't growing. Our, our understanding of the one who we've placed our faith in is, is closer and closer and closer to the reality of his greatness. We see Jesus, and as we act in faith, we see more of the, the perfect, beautiful character of him. Our faith grows, our understanding of who God is grows as we act on what we know. And then we get a, a deeper commitment, and that positive certainty grows stronger and stronger and stronger as we can act in it. So how do we walk up? How do we live our life worthy of the calling we've received? How do we walk worthy of the calling? Number one is, is faith. 
It takes faith to act. How, number two, dependence on the Spirit of God. The only way we will walk worthy, and you see this dripping through these verses, is dependence on the Spirit of God. And how do we show that we're dependent on Him? We seek His face in prayer. We seek His face in prayer. Prayerlessness is the height of independence. Say that again. Prayerlessness is the height of independence. It's the idolatry of self. I got this. I got this. Me, me, me. We must seek the Spirit in prayer. So how number one, faith. How number two, dependence on the Spirit. As we seek His face in prayer. Number three, how? Number three, will we ever walk worthy of the calling we've received? that we must seek his will as expressed in his word. Seek his will as expressed in his word. God has a book. God has written the book and he's given us. He's given us this letter to show us how great he is. And to call us to how to live. Open the book. Seek his will expressed in his word. And can I just tell you, like, there are things in this book that rub me the wrong way. I say the problem isn't with the book. The problem's with me. The problem's with me. Because every word of that book was given by the Holy Spirit of God. Every single word. And it's useful for Showing us who God is and showing us how we are to respond to him. How we are to honor him with our lives. Every single word of that book. And like, the stuff you don't agree with, you're the one that's got the problem. I'm going to show you what the book says. That's it. The stuff my kids don't agree with, problem ain't with the book. The problem is with my kids when they don't agree with it. Problem with it, when their friends don't agree with it, the problem ain't with the book. The problem is with their friends who disagree with the book. We will never walk, hear me, like we will never walk worthy of the calling we've received if we separate our lives from this. It's not going to happen. The most important thing we can do is to seek the Spirit of God in prayer and seek the will of God in His Word every single day. The most important thing, and I don't care if you've got two jobs and five kids, I don't care if you're retired, I don't care if you feel like you barely stand above water, the most important thing any of us will ever do is to seek the Spirit of God in prayer and seek the will of God in the Word. Every single day. So we have faith, seeing the Spirit, seeing His will and His Word. And the last one, keep your shoes on. One step at a time. One step at a time. Like, we're in it for the long haul. And let me tell you, like, if you're about to trip, here's the corporate element, the group element, the church element. If you're about to trip, let someone in this room help you. There was this incredible, incredible, this was long before YouTube. It was when, like, TVs were square and not rectangle. I don't know they're not perfectly square back then, but you get my drift. Like, they were big and heavy. And there was this college football game. Y'all know I'm a sports junkie. I love sports, except hockey. That's not a real sport. Um, sorry, Mike Gurton, if you watch this, just Mike Gurton's a big hockey fan. But there was this incredible uh, 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 college football movie, Marshall. Anybody remember that movie, We Are Marshall? It has nothing to do with the movie. There was this quarterback named Byron Leftwich, who was the offensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for Tom Brady. And I'm telling you, like any of us could call plays if we got Tom Brady. That's a whole other story. Um, Byron Leftwich was a starting quarterback at Marshall, the University of Marshall. They played this little school in Ohio called Akron. And Byron Leftwich, like no doubt, broke his leg in the middle of the game. Broke his leg in the middle of the game. Now this dude, like I think he was a first round draft pick. I mean, he was a superstar. Now, Marshall's not a big school, but he was a superstar. 
and he broke his leg, and then he came back into the field and played with a broken leg, and you know what his offensive lineman did? He completes this like 37-yard pass or whatever it was. His offensive lineman carried him because he couldn't walk anymore. He couldn't walk. Can I tell you, that's why we don't need an individualized faith. That's why we need each other. Because one of us is going to break a leg. One of us is going to blow a knee. One of us is going to stub our toe. And somebody's going to need to be carried. It might not be today, but somebody's going to need to be carried, just like Byron Buckley. was carried down the field. And it was awesome. You can find it on YouTube. Like this whole nonsense that like we're just going to be, I'm just going to be anonymous in the church. That's nonsense. It's not biblical. Like we need each other. Because there's times when I'm going to need you to help carry me. I'm not exempt from needing you being a pastor and you're not exempt from needing each other. None of us is exempt from this. That's why we have to do this as a family. It's what matters. How do we how do we walk worthy of our calling? Faith, dependence, the word, and keep your shoes on. Be ready to help those around you walk. Let's pray. God, you were good, and you were gracious, and you were faithful, and we love you. Father, I pray that we be faithful to what you call us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So our band, uh, <coughs> Nicole and William are going to lead us in this final song, and as they do, I just want to invite you to follow Christ. Join us at the back table, grab the bread and juice, and then I'll uh, come up after a time of, a time of reflection.